Genesis chapter 40 tonight. Genesis chapter 40. How's everybody doing? You guys excited? I think sometimes in our lives we can feel like a trial is never going to end. I don't know if you guys have ever felt like that or ever been there where you felt like maybe finances were just really tough or a relationship was going really bad or you know you just felt like in despair at a job or maybe you were in prison for a long time. I actually talked to a guy last week um, who had been in prison for 13 years and just kind of describing that experience and spent about a year, not quite a year at that time, two thirds of a year in solitary confinement and what that was like, you know, just not having anybody around you, not being able to, you know, talk to anybody. But I think sometimes in our lives we can find ourselves in places where we feel like we are just locked down, like there's no hope, it doesn't seem like there's any any it's just relentless there's no rest from just the constant um trial and you know and it's it's times like that that we have to remember you know and go back and remember that God promises that all things work together for good to those who love him right i mean and that is a difficult thing in the midst of a trial it can be one of the most difficult things and and of course you know it wouldn't be right for anybody to tell you that you know, and that's like the worst thing you can tell somebody if they're going through a long trial. Well, you know, all things work together for good, brother, you know. And, and yet, you know, we know it because we know it already, don't we? I mean, it's not like anybody needs to tell us that. You know, it's like platitudes that just make us frustrated and angry and like, shut up, just go find your, <laughs> find somebody who wants to listen to you. You know, but it, it's true. And, and I think we know that. And so as we're going through trials, we have to realize that God has a plan for even this darkness, even this darkness, even the dungeon that I find myself in. And, you, you know, I you think of the stories in the Bible of just the, the time that God just seemed to be silent in people's lives. And I don't know, maybe that's the, the danger, the, the darkness that you're in right now is you just feel like God isn't speaking to me. God hasn't, I just don't feel like, I feel like my prayers aren't getting anywhere. And, you know, there could be several reasons for that, but I, I know that whenever we're going through a time where we feel like our prayers aren't being heard, um, or that God is like absent from us, you know, we have to realize that God, again, is right next to us, wanting us to feel like He's not next to us, wanting us to feel like He's not hearing us. And, and that's for His purposes and for His reasons, and, you know, we don't always know those things. Um, but there will be a day, right? There will be a day when we know everything. There'll be a day when we will know, even as we are known, that we'll see him face to face and, and all this stuff will become clear. You know, Paul said, for this light affliction, speaking of this life, and you have to remember that Paul's light affliction was being stoned um, with rocks until they thought he was dead, being in prison, being shipwrecked, you know, all those things. He says, this light affliction, which is but for a moment, is going to fade in the exceeding weight of the glory that heaven has revealed to us. And so, you know, we're here for this short period of time. And, and in a sense, a lot of trials and a lot of tests that we're going to go through, a lot of things that we're going to have to endure. And yet nothing that we go through in this life is ever wasted. Nothing is wasted. God uses every moment of that pain, every moment of that failure, every moment of that trial to refine us into what he wants us to be. Now, um, I don't know if you guys have ever gone through a trial that has lasted 10 years. Anybody? <laughs> Claudia is like, yeah, me. <laughs> and, and I know this isn't encouraging. Like maybe you're a year into your trial, you know, in like 10 years. What are you talking about? Um, but think about, you know, just the stories of the Bible. You know, you think about Paul. And Paul, you know, so excited once he found Jesus, so excited to serve the Lord, so excited to be used by God, proving to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, and then being persecuted and driven out of town. And then finally, after Paul was gone, the church had peace, right? 
And, and it was 12 years later, it'd be 12 years later that finally they would go and find Paul up in, um, up in Tarsus and bring him back down to Antioch and God would begin to use him. It's this 12 year waiting period of like, God, I thought you were going to use me. Well, the thing about Moses, Moses at 40, seeing that he was going to be the deliverer of Israel and, and eloquent in speech and in, and in power, you know, the prince of Egypt. And, and he goes to, to take force and protect his people. And of course, he, he, they find out, you know, people find out that he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. And so he runs and he's on the backside of the wilderness watching Jethro's sheep for 40 years. By the time by the time God gets to him and says, Hey, Moses, Moses, take off your feet. You're standing on holy ground. He says, I'm going to send you to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. And, Pharaoh, and Moses is like, I can't speak, right? Starts out eloquent in word and indeed, and now he's 80 years old. And he's like, I can't even speak. What are you talking about? You know, he's like a geezer. And God's going to start his ministry at 80 to become the deliverer. Crazy. And yet God is, it, He uses these things in our lives, these trials that we go through to refine us. You know, time and, and that long period that we have to wait sometimes and we think that God isn't listening or God isn't working or God isn't there. And it is, it's th- that time where God is inactive, He's not working, that He's sharpening His instruments, isn't He? He's sharpening His tools. And that's what you and I are. And He uses those trials and those temptations and those prisons and those dark things in our lives to knock off the rough edges and to to refine us into the weapon, into the sword that He wants you to be and He wants your life to be. And so too it was for Joseph. Now you remember the story of Joseph, I'm sure. Joseph being born into his father's house, the son of his father's old age, of his favorite wife, his, his father's favorite wife, Rachel. And so instantly, um, the favorite of, of Jacob. And he sees this little guy as a guy who he's going to dump his life and his heart into. And he has him made a, a certain coat, a special coat that's better than all the coats that his brothers have. And he, he's... Um, kind of raised to know that he's the favorite. And yet, no doubt, Jacob spent that time, you know, refining that little guy and pouring into him and talking to him about the Lord. Obviously, he'd missed that boat with his other ten older brothers. You know, they all kind of turned out to be scoundrels. And, and, and Joseph would have these dreams, remember? The first dream was the one where the wheat would bow down, the sheaves of wheat of his, the, you know, the 11 sheaves would bow down to his sheaf. And he told that to his brothers and they said, are, are we going to bow down to you? Will you be greater than us? You know, of course that made them angry. Then again, he had another dream where the star spangled sky, he saw the, the 11 stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to his star. And, and of course, his father picked up on that and he says, shall your mother and, and, and I and your brothers bow down to you? And he rebuked him, but his father, remember, held it in his heart. He considered it. But, but then, of course, you know, he'd, he'd already told on his brothers one time and being sent out to Dothan to find his brothers, um, he finds them in Dothan and, and they see him coming a long way off and they decide immediately, hey, we're just going to take this guy and kill him. And of course, some of the brothers intervened, Judah and, and Reuben, weren't really into the whole killing him thing, and so they put him in a pit, and then of course, Judah says, hey, why don't we sell him off to these slave traders that are coming? And the Midianites came, they sold him into Egypt, and he was sold into Potiphar's house as a slave. And being a slave in the house, God blessed him, God was with him, and so he rose to the top, and he was the, the chief slave in all of Potiphar's house, and Potiphar didn't even know what he had because he trusted Joseph so much that he put everything into his hands. Until one day, of course, remember, Potiphar's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. You know, and he said, you know, no way, Jose. And one day he came in alone when the other men were out of the house and she grabbed him by the cloak and said, lie with me forcefully. And he left his cloak behind and ran out of the house in his skivvies. 
And she held his cloak and screamed out, this man tried to rape me. And of course, when Potiphar got home and hears the report that Joseph had tried to rape her, knowing Joseph's character and no doubt knowing his wife's character, rather than putting him to death, which would have happened to any slave who tried to rape the wife of an important official, the captain of the guard, he puts him into prison. And of course was put in in that prison and, and in the prison. If you remember, it says in verse 23 of chapter 39, the keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him and whatever he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Remember, we talked about this a little bit. How would it be? Role model, citizen, role model prisoner, you know, and his mom can put that on her bumper sticker. My son <laughs> is the role model prisoner, you know, honor prisoner. But that's who Joseph was. And so he went from the favorite in his house to the favorite in the prison. And I, I guarantee you that the favorite in an Egyptian prison is probably not a fun place to be, no matter how prestigious his, his place was. You know, you could probably hand out books and stuff like that. You know, you got to walk down the cell block, you know, and hand books between the bars. I don't know what his job was, but you, you have to imagine that this was a horrible circumstance. And, and what it doesn't tell us, but what we kind of can figure out as we look at the timeline here is that Joseph was in this prison. Are you ready for this? between 10 to 13 years. Can you imagine? He was in this prison for a long, long time because he would, he would end up becoming or standing before Pharaoh in his 30s for the first time as, we're, as the story progresses. But I mean, this is a long time. And so it says, it came to pass after these things that the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their lord the king of Egypt. Now, contrary to what you might know, and maybe your, your, your Bible says cupbearer, um, and you might think, oh, this is the guy that tasted the wine before the Pharaoh did. And actually, um, not really, because it was Egypt where they created beer. And beer was the preferred drink of Egypt. They drank beer there. In fact, it was found in some of the ancient hieroglyphics that some of the professors of the students who um, studied in the Egyptian schools said all of the students don't care for their studies, but are always carousing and drinking beer. Some things never change, right? (laughs) That's kind of the way that it was. But that's true. They, They invented beer in Egypt, and that's what they mostly drank was beer. Not cold beer, because they didn't have any way to chill it, but they drank warm beer. If you can imagine. Um, but he, here's the guy, the, the butler was the cupbearer of the king. And so what he, his choice idea would be to drink the water, or the beer, or the wine, or whatever the, the pharaoh was going to drink. He would drink it first. They would wait a little while to see if he dropped dead. And if he was good, then he would give it to the pharaoh and the pharaoh would drink it. And that kind of kept the pharaoh, it was kind of a safeguard for the pharaoh. Now, of course, the baker, um, he was the one who was, you know, and actually they found in, again, in hieroglyphics and um, ancient Egyptian writings, they found all kinds of recipes for cakes and breads. And so this guy, um, we don't know if he was the only cook of the king, but we know that whatever the king ate was probably bread. Maybe he fell sick suddenly after eating and drinking, and he didn't know which one of these guys was maybe the saboteur. Or maybe both of them were conspiring against him to put him to death or whatever. And so he has them both thrown in prison. The the baker, the guy who would taste the food or cook the food, prepare the food, and the guy who would um, taste the drink before it got to Pharaoh. And he was angry with them. It says, verse 2, the Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and the chief baker. Somehow the candlestick maker made it away. So he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison, the place where Joseph was confined. Now I want you to remember in chapter 39, if you don't remember, if you, or if you weren't here last time, remember in chapter 39, verse 1, it says, Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, the officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. And so now we see that again here, and Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief butler and chief baker, so he put them in the custody 
in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison in the place where Joseph was confined. And so this guy, this Potiphar, was actually the chief executioner and prison keeper of the place where Joseph was kept. It's pretty amazing to think about. It doesn't say it straight up, but here we see um, Potiphar kind of keeping Joseph under his watchful eye. Verse 4, And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, so that they were in custody for a while. And so um, we don't know how much time has passed, but we know some time has passed. He's getting to know these two guys, and they're in his custody. He is the one who's in charge of making sure that um, they're behaving, that they're getting what they need, um, and that whatever's going on in the prison is is um, under Joseph's control. And so he's in their custody. He sees... What's going on with them? And then verse 5, and this is key, it says, Then the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, had a dream, and both of them, each man's dream, in one night, and each man's dream with his own interpretation. So Joseph came into them, and in the morning, and, or in the morning, and looked at them, and saw that they were sad. Okay, so now this is why we know there's been some time. Because... Wouldn't you be sad if you were in prison anyway? <laughs> right? I mean, so he, Joseph, he's extra sensitive to, to what's going on here. And I think that this is important because as you think about Joseph, he's been in this prison who knows how long, you know, 10 years, 8 years. We don't know exactly how long, but it's been almost a decade, if not a decade, that he's been in prison already. And now he, he has these two prisoners come and he's in charge of them and he wakes up one morning and he looks at these two prisoners who are in prison, who are sad by virtue of the fact that they're in prison and notices that they're sadder than they normally would be sad in this prison. And what this shows me and what this shows us is that Joseph, he cared about them for one because he's paying attention to their countenance even though seems normal to be sad, right? But he notices there's something wrong with them. And so he's paying attention. He's not just realizing that he's in charge of these guys, but he's genuinely concerned about their welfare. And I think that that's something to note when you think about Joseph because he's been rotting in a prison. And I don't know about you, but I think that it would have been very difficult for me um, after being drug across the Egyptian sand all the way, or across the sand all the way to Egypt, and, and then sold on a slave block, that I would probably have a little bit of bitterness and resentment towards my brothers. And then being sold as a slave, and then being a, a, approached by this attractive woman to lie with me, that I would, I might think, hey, you know what? This whole thing has just been a, a big um, joke, and my life is a joke, and my brothers are a joke, and my whole everything is just a lie and now I've been sold into Egypt and God's forsaken me and everybody's forsaken me and why not, right? I mean, if you think that there would ever be a circumstance where somebody could justify um, taking pleasure in sin, you'd think it was Joseph, but at that moment, he says, how could I do this great wickedness against my, my master, but also against God? How could I do this wickedness against God? And he does not, he's not blaming God for where he's at. And because he stood up for righteousness and did the right thing at the right time, he gets thrown into prison. And so if he wasn't ready to you know, forsake God and, and feel like he'd been abandoned by God in, as a slave, now he's a prisoner and he's been there for a long time. And you imagine, could you imagine if you were rotting in a Mexican prison for... 10 years and you don't you know you don't know anybody and you're kind of uh, the outsider and you're an american and you're not a native and, and how you would feel forgotten and left and so here he is in this prison forgotten and left and he still cares about other people you know you would think that he would be hardened and bitter and angry and you know what i don't care about life i don't care about anybody and I, maybe he went through times like that but the bible definitely doesn't record it in fact, all we see is integrity and, and just the right heart and the right attitude no matter what the circumstances have been because the circumstances are, are much worse than what we're even reading here, if you can imagine. I mean, we, we read through a couple chapters and we're like, boy, that was really tough for him. But I mean, think about actually being there for 10 years. Crazy stuff. 
So Joseph noticed that they were sad. Verse 7, So he asked Pharaoh's officers who were with him in the custody of his Lord's house, saying, Why do you look so sad today? Because we're in prison. Because <laughs> I'm used to a soft bed and I'm laying on this stone floor. I don't know. I mean, why are you so sad today? Out of all the sadnesses that you've had, this is the worst sadness. Why are you sadder today than you've been before? And they said to him, We each have had a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. So Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell them to me, please. Now you have to understand that in their culture and in their custom, the Egyptians had a lot of books or writings about interpreting dreams. And so this was something that was common. They took dreams very seriously. They believed that when you were in a dream state, that you were interfacing with another world, with a supernatural world. And so they were very, very aware that something in a dream could be significant, and especially a dream that was extra troubling. And so normally what they would do as the chief baker and the chief butler, well, they'd go right down to the soothsayers and they'd say, I've had this horrible dream, please tell me what it means. But here in the prison they have no access to that type of knowledge. They have no access to that type of, of counsel. And so they're sitting there thinking, you know, what are these dreams about and what are we going to do about them? And Joseph comes and he says, what, why are you sad? They say, we've had a dream. Each, each one of us have had a dream that's troubled us. And, and Joseph says, don't interpretations of dreams belong to God? And, 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 and let me just say right here that this shows us something about Joseph that is actually pretty amazing. First of all, you would have think that he would have long believed that dreams were a bunch of hooey by now, right? He had two dreams, and so far, he hasn't risen to the top, he's sunk to the bottom. And yet what this proves to us is that he understood that his dreams were significant, and this is the most important thing, and I think this is where we learn our lesson. His dreams were significant, and he believed no matter how bad the circumstances have gotten, God is still going to fulfill my dreams. I know that God, there is going to be a day, I may be in this prison now, but there is going to come a day that my brothers are going to come and they're going to bow down before me. That my family, I'm going to see them again and they're going to bow down before me. He knew and believed that God was the one who held the interpretation of dreams. You would think at this point he would not be asserting such nonsense, right? Right? But here he is saying, only God, only God can interpret dreams. Then the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, Behold, in my dream a vine was before me, verse 10, and and in the vine were three branches. It was as though it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and its clusters brought forth ripe grapes. Then Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And so he he has this crazy dream of of actually crushing the grapes himself. Of course, this wouldn't have been his job. His job would just be take the wine and drink it and then give it to Pharaoh. But here he's actually doing the whole thing. And, And Joseph said to him, verse 12, this is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Now within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your place. And you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand according to the former manner when you were his butler. But remember me when it is well with you and please show kindness to me. Make mention of me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For indeed I was stolen away from the land of the Hebrews And from the land of the Hebrews, or excuse me, and also I have done nothing here that should put me into this dun, into the dungeon. And so he's, he sees this, you know, not only as an opportunity and, and he, it's not like in Daniel's day when Daniel hears that the king has had a dream and he has to go have a prayer meeting with his buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and, and they press into God and say, God help us in this situation. And then God, grants it to him is it's like Joseph is so honed by this time in his life, so close to the Lord, 
that he hears the dream, knowing that God has the interpretation, and immediately gives the interpretation to them. There's no waiting, there's no pause, just immediately. But then also seeing, maybe this is what God is using, and saying, hey, remember me. And this is really significant, remember me. Now, it's amazing because this guy will not remember him. He's not going to remember. I mean, that's bad news, isn't it, sometimes? You ever have somebody forget something? I have a pastor friend. A lady came up to him and says, You forgot about me. And he says, Oh, that's strange. I don't remember the last time I forgot. <laughs> so I use that every once in a while. I don't remember the last time I forgot. You know, it's, and it's, 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 a, it's a frustrating thing when somebody forgets something. You know, and you're kind of depending on them. But in this case, it's going to be a supernatural forgetting. You ever experienced that where somebody supernaturally forgot something? You're going to claim that next time, aren't you? God made me forget, right? <laughs> no, you know, one time, and this is kind of an interesting story, um, when my wife was talking to the ladies at the pastor's wife's retreat when my son was going to be born, you know, they prophesied over her that we were going to have a child, you know, very miraculous. And the lady told her his name's going to be Isaiah. And then she read Isaiah 40 verse 31. And she said, you know, the, um, it says, uh, what does it say? Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not grow weary. They walk and not grow faint. You know, and, and she, my wife circled it in her Bible she wrote next to it, his name is Isaiah. And by the time she had gotten on the plane and gotten home, she completely forgotten. And she said, she told me his name and it was, uh, I think she said Elijah or Ezekiel or something like that. I know it was biblical. And I'm like, uh, no, doesn't sound right to me, you know. So then six months go by, she gets pregnant, a month, a month to the day from that day, a month later she got pregnant. Six months go by, and we are fighting over it. I mean, we've we got baby name books, everything. We're trying to figure out what his name's going to be. Nothing, you know, I like something, she doesn't like it. She likes something, I don't like it. Nothing sounds right. We kind of agree on Jonathan Edward. You know, my middle name's Edward, Jonathan Edward Hughes. Sounded good. And then my sister says, oh, that John Edwards guy that's like the, you know the prophet or the, you know, soothsayer guy on TV. I'm like, oh no, we can't name him that, you know, stupid stuff. And so we're at my sister's house six months after she's, you know, after that time, six months later, she's pregnant. We're ta- still talking about names and I'm, I'm in the hallway and I'm, I'm wrapping up the vacuum cord. I can't remember what I vacuumed up, but I'm wrapping up the vacuum cord and, and my sister and my other sister and my wife, they're all in the kitchen and they're all talking And I remember just standing there in the hallway and I said, Lord, you know what his name is. And my sister, Terry, said, what What about Isaiah Michael? And Shannon says, oh, I like that. And she said, honey, what about Isaiah Michael? I said, that's his name. I knew it the second she said it. That's his name. And I thought, how could she have forgotten Isaiah? Of course, she, you know. And so then when the... um, when the baby was born, we named him Isaiah Michael. He's sitting back there. Uh, we named him Isaiah Michael. And then, um, she, she, of course, she just had the baby. So she didn't go to the next year's Pastor's Wives Conference. So a year went by, another year went by. She went two years later, finally. And Olga and Cindy Lou, the two ladies that had prophesied over her, said, Sh- are, Shannon, Shannon, did you have the baby? And she's like, yes, yes, I did. And she says, sorry, I didn't send out the birth announcement. And she's like, that's okay. What, did you name him Isaiah. And she's like, is that what you told me? And she's like, yeah, I remember I told you, Isaiah 40, verse 31. My wife opens her Bible, looks at it, there it is, circled, his name is Isaiah. <laughs> Supernaturally forgotten. And good good that it was. Because, I mean, what greater miracle it was when the whole thing went down. And my sister even named it, it wasn't even us. You know, um, just to see how God worked that out. You know, God sometimes has his reasons for things. And, and you know, I believe that everything that God does in our lives is for a purpose. You know, sometimes we may not feel it. <laughs> We're in the middle of horrible circumstances, difficult trials, you know, and, and we don't know why this is happening. But again, it is during that silent time, the time where we're waiting, just like it says in Isaiah 40, verse 31, those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. 
It is that time that we're waiting for God to move. And when, when it talks about waiting on the Lord, it's not just like, oh, come on, God, why is my life so awful? It is, it's what Joseph's doing here. This is a perfect example of what it means to wait on the Lord. He's believing in the Lord. He's trusting in the Lord. Do not interpretations belong to the Lord, not to, to man. He's still trusting in the Lord in the midst of this prison, knowing that God has a plan for him and waiting patiently. Remember what it says in Romans chapter 12. We covered it just a few weeks ago on Sunday morning. But in Romans chapter 12, verse 12, it says, Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfast in prayer. You know, and that's where we have to find ourselves. You know, maybe you don't, maybe you're not quite to the place where James tells his brother, my brother, and consider it pure joy when you fall into various trials. You know, I mean, maybe you're not, maybe you're not to that place yet where you're like, oh, goody, trials. So happy. <laughs> consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you fall into various trials. But I think that as we mature and as we go through life in the Lord and we see God come through on one trial, we see God come through on another trial, and, and as time goes, goes on, we're finally to the point where we're like, you know what, I can see how God has used the trials of my past to shape me for the future, or shape me who, for who I am. I found Him, and this is important, to be faithful. And, and in the midst of all this, Joseph has found God to be faithful. I mean, he's a, he, he becomes a slave, but you know, God's favor is upon him. He rises to the top. Wow, you know, God must be with me. But then he's accused falsely and he's thrown into prison, but then again, he rises to the top. Wow, God must be with me. You know, God, I don't understand the trial that I'm in right now, but I believe the promises that you've given me and I think that I can hold to those. Even though I can't see how you could ever make me important enough for my brothers to bow down to me, I, I know that you're going to do that. I know you're going to get me through this. I know you're going to make it happen. It's up to you. It's not up to me. And, and Joseph just waits patiently on the Lord and waits for him to bring about this. But Joseph is now seeing maybe an opportunity, a glimmer of hope. And hope deferred makes the heart sick, doesn't it? And he says, remember me. Now this reminds me because Jesus was on the cross. He was between two thieves, right? Here Joseph is in prison between two accused criminals. And on the cross as Jesus hung there, one of the thieves says, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. Remember that? Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. Joseph, it's almost the opposite, but it's a parallel. And Joseph says, remember me when you enter back to your place in the kingdom. And the guy, he, he promises he will, but then he forgets. And God's, again, his timing on this whole thing is perfect. If, if he would have just gone to Pharaoh and said, hey, this guy got me out of prison, let him go. They probably would have let him go and sent him back off to Israel. And that would have been the end of it. But God had a greater purpose in all of it, which we'll see. So it says, verse 16, when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream and there were three white baskets on my head and the uppermost basket were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh and the birds ate them out of the basket on my head. And so he, he's saying, oh, you know, three vines, grapes squeezed into the, the Pharaoh's cup. I had baked goods on my head, you know, and three baskets. So maybe my interpretation is the same. The thing that we, we want to notice here, and this is something that um, we, you learn in Bible class, is that there is what they call the law of expositional constancy. Now, I doubt the chief baker knew this law. But whenever there is something that's used as a metaphor, a type, or um, you know, a simile within the Bible, a parable, whenever there's an object used, it seems that that object rep represents the same thing every time. And so when we see leaven as a type of sin... You should always look at every parable as leaven, as a type of sin. You know, when, when you look at birds represent evil, 
Here's the first time we see birds eating out of the basket. Later, the birds are the ones who steal the seed from the sower. Remember, it's the evil one coming and and the birds lodging in the branches of the church, the, the kingdom of God. It's evil. It always represents evil. And so it makes it saves us a lot of trouble. You look through the entire Bible. And you can imagine my distress when I went to a pastor's sum, prayer summit. We're all up in the woods. I'm with all these pastors from all over the Treasure Valley. And one of the pastors starts praying. You know, he talks about how, you know, the woman hid leaven in a measure of meal and it became three measures and they were all filled with leaven. And then he was saying, you know, leaven is the gospel and we need to pray the leaven over the whole treasure valley. And I'm like, ah, no, because leaven represents sin. You know, I can't teach these guys, right? But this is, it's consistent throughout the Bible. You'll notice that when something is used as a metaphor or a simile, that it seems to follow that pattern all the way through Old and New Testament. And so here we see these birds in the basket on top of his head. You know, he thinks it's going to be a favorable interpretation. Verse 18, so Joseph answered and said, this is the interpretation of it. The three baskets are three days. Same as the three vines, right? Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat your flesh from you. Not so good. huh? (laughs) The first interpretation, that's pretty sweet. This one, eh, not so great. Birds are going to eat your flesh off your body. Now it came to pass on the third day. That's another interesting thing. You know, three days later, they were raised up out of the prison. One guy was gone. The other guy was there. You know, kind of another um, parallel to Jesus raising on the third day. But now it came to pass on the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, that he made a feast for all his servants and he lifted up the head of his chief butler and of the chief baker among the servants. And he restored the chief butler to his butlership again, and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, and he hanged the chief baker as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief butler did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So sad. <laughs> so sad. He, he, how, did he, how could he forget? Again, I guarantee you. See, the thing about it was, is in, in Egypt, when somebody were to interpret your dream they would be responsible if your dream didn't come to pass. Or rewarded if it did, maybe punished if it didn't. And so here's Joseph, he tells him the dream, it came to pass, and he forgets him. And he'll say later, I remember my sin, right? As we get into the next chapter, which I don't think we have time to get that far into the next chapter today. But what I want to do is go back to Psalm 105 and look at that just one more time. We looked at this before. So notice in verse 16. Moreover, he, God, called for a famine in the land. He destroyed all the provision of bread. So this is God's plan. He's calling for a famine in the land and destroying all the provision of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. You know, you think of you know, this, this baker in, in a sense a metaphor, Right? A guy who was responsible for making the bread and making everything and his head was lifted off of him. He was killed. Um, Now God is calling for this famine. And so this is kind of a foreshadowing of what's to come. But it will be two years later, two years later that Pharaoh will have a dream. And that's two whole, I'm going to tell us that at the beginning of chapter 41. Two whole years later, Pharaoh had a dream that troubled him and then the chief butler says, oh, I remember my sin. There's a man in the prison rotting there for the last two years. You know, think about, I mean, think about this. So you can imagine Joseph, he he interprets this dream. He's sitting in the prison. He's thinking, by the end of the day, I'm out of here. By the end of the day, I'm out of here. The next day comes by. Okay, surely it's going to be today. A week goes by. A month goes by. A year goes by. All hope is lost, right? Two years goes by. He's forgotten about it. 
You know, sometimes we just feel like God's forgotten us. And yet God's timing is perfect. You know, remember Jonah who was in the belly of the boat sleeping. And yet the whole time, all that time while Joseph or while Jonah is sleeping in the belly of the boat, God had prepared a fish. And he was swimming <laughs> on the way to where that boat was on its way to Tarshish. And when they threw Jonah overboard, there was the fish to swallow him up. And while Jonah was repenting, while Jonah thought his life was over, some people believe even Jonah died in the belly of the fish and God resurrected him, I don't know. But the whole time the fish was moving, wasn't it? And probably swimming around the Horn and up the Tigris River and spitting him out on the beach as the fishermen stood there and watched. You know, it's amazing. God has everything planned. He, he picked Jonah because he knew he would run. He knew he would run away because he knew that the people in Nineveh worshipped Dagon, the fish god, and that they weren't going to listen to any old prophet. But when a prophet gets spit out on the beach by a fish, and the people run into the town and say, hey, look at this guy. He just came out of a fish. And he says, judgment comes in 40 days. People are going to listen, Right? God knew exactly what it would take for them to listen. And so too here. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Psalm 105, verse 18. They hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid in irons. Um, It's interesting. The Septuagint says his soul was hardened. His, His soul was made iron. You know, and that's what God was doing, was refining Joseph, this entire time, he was preparing him. He was making him into the man he would need to be to be the leader in Egypt. Because before this, he was just a young boy who was a favorite in his father's house, and you know, a lot of pride. Hey, I had dreams about you guys, and you're all bowing down to me, you know. But God was working in his heart until the time that His word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. And that's what that, the, all those years, from probably 18 years old until 30 years old, God tested Joseph, tested Joseph, tested Joseph. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of the house and ruler of all his possessions to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Israel also came to Egypt and Jacob dwelt in the land. Of Ham. He increased his people greatly. He made him stronger than their enemies. He turned their heart to hate his people, to deal craftily with his servants. And then he rose up Moses. And so God, he's working through all these things for his purpose. Why did he send Joseph in this manner to refine him, to make him into a man who was worthy to be the leader so that he could save the world? What would be more important, Joseph's comfort? Or the salvation of the world through the storage of bread. Not just the salvation of the world through the storage of bread, but the salvation of the world through the preservation of the nation of Israel that would bring about the Messiah who would save the world from their sins. If Joseph wouldn't have been sent, the Messiah never would have come. The children of Israel would have all died. So God has greater things happening than we can possibly ever imagine and, and, and even though we might be in the midst of the storm, God is still working. He's still moving. He is purposing. And the key for us is in the middle of that to not lose heart. To cling to Him, to trust in Him, and to say, God, I know that You have promises for me, that You tell me that all things work together for good to those who love You and those who are the called according to Your purpose. And if that's true then I will hold on to you and watch you bring all this about for good. Because I know you will. You know, I think that that's where we have to live as Christians is this idea and this this unrelenting idea that, that God loves me as I would love a child of my own and that He is He wants to bless me and to keep faith in Him. Without Him, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Right?
Let's pray.